Today we're going to talk about triple integration with cylindrical and spherical coordinates. And in general, if you've got any kind of symmetry about the z-axis, oftentimes these are a good idea. And they can turn uh, integrals that would otherwise be ugly in rectangular coordinates into, relatively speaking, easier integrals uh, using the different coordinate systems. So let's revisit the example that we started when we introduced um, triple integrals and rectangular coordinates. Uh, we were trying to figure the volume out of this uh, what's called an egg bounded between these two paraboloids. And while it might be possible, and it looks like my image is uh, chopping off the DX for which I apologize, but uh, it, looks, it might be possible. It just seems like it might be kind of a bear to calculate. So um, let's just see what happens if, uh, if we could try polar coordinates. So now cylindrical coordinates is a common name, but really all it is is um, just uh, using polar coordinates in the input plane, well, not input plane, but the x, y plane using r and theta, and then letting z be the usual um, sort of vertical coordinate, if you will. So z is our usual rectangular coordinates, and then polar coordinates in the input plane. Um, I'm gonna call it the input plane because you can oftentimes solve these for z, but it doesn't have to be. Um, so the area differential, used to be the x dy for the double integral in a plane, uh, whereas now we know the polar uh, or cylindrical area differential is r d r d theta. So toying with uh, our a triple integral to calculate volume, integrating the volume differential, our volume differential becomes dz um, right here. And then our outer integrals would be r d r d theta, rearranging that, this little r, is gonna be part of the integral. We'll need to integrate that. So back to our example, let's let's uh, let's kind of look at this thing and see what would happen if we did convert it into polar coordinates. Well, we know that x squared plus y squared. Whoops, sorry about that. Didn't mean to pop the video on there. We know that x squared plus y squared equals r squared there, and so factoring out the negative, you can turn that into r squared. Um, there's a little bit more to the rest of it, but we've done this conversion of um, between rectangular coordinates and cylinder coordinates before using r cosine of theta for x and r sine of theta for y respectively. So instead of working this through, I'm just going to, here's our conversion, and that'll generate um, the double integral. So we've, all right, so let me start that again. So we've got our inner integral there, but now the double integral as before is related to the projection of our surface in three space, or not surface, but region in three space, solid, let's call it a solid in three space, um, that's projected down onto the xy plane. And if you let, for this particular problem, if you let r vary between remembering that that is square root of two. So if you let r vary from one to square root of two, you're gonna generate slices like this. And as you let theta vary all the way from zero to two pi, you will generate the entire region that we're integrating over. So let's work integral out. So our inner integral becomes integrating r with respect to z. So Ridiculous, Brian. Sorry, sometimes I type these and you know, I catch these mistakes. I'll change that. So integrating r with respect to z would be r times z. And then substituting in, uh, evaluating the definite integral there, substituting in 4 minus r squared for z, and then subtracting to that from that, substituting in for z is equal to r squared. Put that all together, and you get 4r minus uh, 2r to the third power. Now, despite my earlier typo, that is correct. Now my notes will go away, for which I apologize, but we know that this should be rz. All right, so now integrating rz, uh, well, not integrating rz, but integrating the result of our inner integral in our middle integral, we get 2r squared minus 1 half r to the fourth power. Um, and then we evaluate that from r is equal to root 2 to 0. Doing that gives us 2. 
And then once again, we take the result of our iterated integral and it becomes the integrand for our last outermost integral. And we have the integral with respect to theta of two becomes two theta evaluating that from zero to two pi gives us two times two pi, which is four pi minus zero. And there we have our answer. Now, I, I hope that you guys look at that and say, yeah, that was most likely, or you can believe that that was most likely significantly easier than trying to tackle this rig using rectangular coordinates. Took a little bit of work to convert it, but the work compared to trying to integrate that thing involving all those roots and stuff, it's probably far, far easier. So what are we actually doing? What, do, what does this look like? What, what's happening here? As usual, we'll take a look at a nice um, thing here. Let it load. So thinking as the xy coordinate plane as our input plane for each point in the projection below our surface or our region in space onto the xy plane, we're going to have what we're going to call this little surface slice there. And now as we let r vary, we're going to generate a slice like that. That goes through that notice that goes through that particular point. And if we let r vary along that line, the line that had that point in it, we're going to get a slice like that. And as then, we let, now that we've let r vary, let's let theta vary and we'll generate all of these slices that kind of fan out and give us our volume for that region. All right, back to our slides. So here's a general method to kind of, that I like to attack or use to attack when uh, generating the limits of integration with respect to using polar or cylindrical coordinates. First things first is sketch the region in space space and the polar projection. Uh, GeoGebra can oftentimes be really helpful for visualizing this and, and helping us see like what we need to do so that we can draw a reasonably good sketch on our paper. So once you have your sketch, then I tackle the Z bounds. And as before, we've just converted the X and Y terms into polar. We're still gonna have Z max and Z min kind of being that, that vertical kind of line segment um, that we saw in the last uh, rectangular coordinate uh, trip with triple integrals. Uh, then it becomes the task of where we're going to use polar coordinates. That's down into the projection onto the polar plane. And this is just the same thing we've been doing before when we're working with um, double integrals uh, using polar coordinates. And while it is possible to do these in different orders, this is by far the most common application of cylindrical or polar coordinates is to stick to this kind of order of integration where you figure out Z is gonna be your innermost integral and then set up the double integral for your uh, outermost two integrals using polar coordinates for the projection into the plane. So it's gonna become, we're gonna be, it's going to be necessary to convert between rectangular coordinates and polar coordinates. So let's review those real quick. I wrote them out real quick, but here X is equal to R cosine of theta and Y is equal to R sine of theta. That's our definition of polar coordinates. And as a consequence of those two facts, we have these two identities of X squared plus Y squared equals R squared and tangent of theta equals Y over X. And using those four equations, we can typically take uh, anything uh, given to us in terms of X and Y and convert it a rectangular x and y and convert it into polar coordinates. So let's try and do an example here. We're not going to integrate this. We're just going to say, hey, let's let's do a general rect, uh, general triple integral over some function f. And I'm deliberately not telling us what the function is. But over the domain of integration d, where d is the region above the z equals 0 plane inside the cylinder, x squared plus y minus 1 quantity squared equals 1. Um, and in below the surface, z is equal to x squared plus y squared. So we're going to work through that kind of same approach that we just showed. And let's see, let's start by first drawing a sketch. And yeah, I absolutely use GeoGebra to help myself sketch this thing here. Well, let's see, let's try and relate these things. Um, that sort of bluish purple surface you see inside of that cylinder, that's going to be z is equal to x squared plus y squared. We've seen that before. z is equal to x squared plus y squared is the paraboloid if we kind of let it vary like that. Um, and so we're just restricting that thing to being over this, this particular region. Well, what is what region are we restricting it to? Uh, this x squared plus the quantity y minus one squared equals one is a cylinder. And it, all I did was just type that into GeoGebra and it gave me that big vertical thing. Yes, I used a little bit of fanciness to restrict that to just showing the portion inside that cylinder. But you could probably do something similar by just plotting these in general and then saying, all right, this is what I need. I also emphasize that what, what uh, 
this this region in here is going to okay so let's let me highlight this thing let me use green here because that'll show up so the region we're interested in is the the region below that paraboloid contained inside of that cylinder above the z equals zero plane so i emphasized the projection of the region below our purple surface or blue surface down onto the plane and so this whole region right in here is what we're interested in this is going to be our region that we're going to integrate over. So beneath that little purple thing above the, the plane and contained within the cylinder. So our sketch is pretty good. Sorry, I'm not better at GeoGebra to know how to get rid of the cylinder above or below that, but we can, you know, it's human. It's, it's human. It's how you guys might be attacking this. All right, so we've got our Z bounds to tackle next. So we want to imagine, all right, if I were to take a slice for any point uh, in the projection, down onto the plane. It would start there at the bottom and then it would hit that surface on the top. So I'd have Z min down here. Well, that's that's equal to zero. And then my Z max or my top, if you will, well, that's gonna be something. If we were working in rectangular coordinates, we would have X squared plus Y squared here. But we're working in polar coordinates. So we're gonna convert that X squared plus Y squared that's a pretty direct conversion since it's equal to R squared. So our Z max is going to be R squared. And that's summarized in the next bullet point here. Lost the, lost the picture though. All right, so now it's time to tackle the projection, the outer two integrals. Now we've got our inner integral bounds set up and now our outer two integrals, we need to worry about the projection in the plane. And so, Here's our projection plotted in, uh, in Desmos. And as a reminder, to get this in Desmos, you can just type in R is equal to sine uh, two. Make sure you get the number two in there. Let's write that better. R is equal to two sine. And then if you type theta, yep, we've seen this before, Geo, or Desmos will, will turn it into the theta sine and give you a very nice pretty thing. And to make it filled in, all I did was less than or equal to there. Um, I've got an animation here, which I think is kind of nice. So let's have a look at that. All right, so as an illustration uh, to convince us that letting theta vary from zero to pi and letting r be from zero to less than our bounding two sine of theta, we've got this kind of nice animation here that I wrote real quick. Well, that's great, but there's a little bit of math happening in the background. So let's just go ahead and, and work this out. Let's, let's actually do the conversion here real quick. Okay, so I'm gonna convert X to R cosine of theta and Y to R sine of theta. That's going to give us R cosine of theta, the entire quantity squared, plus R sine of theta minus one squared is equal to R. Okay, we're gonna multiply this stuff out. That's gonna give us R squared cosine squared of theta plus R squared sine squared of theta. Uh, let's see, we're gonna get minus two R sine of thetas, let's make that a theta. Um, and then we're gonna get plus one equals one. All right, so I'm noticing here that if I factor out an R squared of this expression, I've got cosine squared plus sine squared. So that's gonna give us just R squared minus two R sine of theta equals to zero. Setting those two things, we'll, we'll get one R isolated on one side. Our goal here, as always with polar coordinates, is to get R isolated. So we've got R squared is equal to two R sine of theta and multiplying both sides by one over R or dividing if you would prefer, uh, you get R is equal to two sine of theta and we've done it. Okay, so. Our R bounds are going to vary between zero and two sine of theta. And then in the picture, that would look like, hey, let this thing, let this start at, pick any angle. I'll pick pi over three here for just because it's convenient. And now let R vary. How far do we want R to vary? We want R to vary right until it hits here. What is this curve? That curve is defined by R equals two sine of theta. So we're going to let it vary between zero and two sine of theta. And now to see what angle we need, well, visually it looks like if we let the angle go from there to there. And again, we're gonna use um, technology to confirm this, but yeah, if you check it, sure enough, pi will generate the whole thing because we've got angle zero here and angle pi here. So we're gonna let theta vary between zero and pi. 
Now putting that all together, we've got, now I've written it as a double integral here because I don't have, I haven't included our inner integral yet, but we're, remember we're integrating the function f and it's an arbitrary function. I emphasized here that we've also converted f into polar or cylindrical coordinates. If it was given to us in x, y terms, we'd have to convert that into polar as well. But there's our, our limits of integration for our outer two most integrals. Putting that information together with what we found out originally for, for our uh, z limits of integration, remembering that that was going to be our innermost integral, we have now went ahead and put it all together. Notice that I also, um, back to the prior slide, I took and kind of emphasized that that r drd theta that comes along with the area differential for polar coordinates is, is included in the integrand there. You have to make sure that you incorporate that into the resulting thing. So once again, we've got that emphasized that that's included in the integrand there. So that's kind of the process of setting up uh, limits of integration using polar coordinates and triple integrals. Sorry, I call it polar coordinates a lot. Um, cylindrical polar coordinates, really the same thing with z just being in terms of polar coordinates. Okay, so now the second type of uh, coordinate system that we're gonna explore is spherical, spherical coordinates, sorry about that. So just as kind of a review, spherical points are of the form uh, P is equal to rho theta phi. PHI for the funny little symbol that we've seen, um, where rho is defined to be the distance between the point and the origin, as you can kind of see down here on this picture. Rho is the distance between the point and the origin. And then theta is the same as cylindrical coordinates, or uh, yeah, cylindrical coordinates or polar coordinates. And so down in the input plane, letting theta vary tells you, okay, you've got a distance from the origin, Let's swing it out off that x-axis in the usual anti-clockwise direction in the plane. And that'll kind of give us a direction to put that distance. And then last but not least, we need to know how do we relate this sort of to the z-axis. So far we're stuck in the plane, but to relate it to the z-axis, we use phi and that's the angle formed with the positive z-axis and the position vector to point P. So phi is this, you swing down from the positive x-axis. Now, since we're swinging down from the positive x-axis and we're letting theta vary, just like cylindrical coordinates, we're going to let that theta vary all the way around in the plane, we would have redundancy and kind of duplication of things if we let phi go further than straight down all the way down to the bottom here. At If you're thinking of this angle as zero and swinging down from that, then this angle is going to be pi, and that's the reason we restrict phi to go between zero and pi. So when phi is zero, you're up on the positive z-axis. When phi is pi over two, you've landed on the, the xy plane or the polar plane, if you will. Uh, no, not polar, because we're in spherical. The xy plane, let's call it that, even though x and y isn't involved. That way we know what we're after. And then when phi is p, we're down on the negative z-axis. Now here's a tip, I don't know, my row. I'm pretty comfortable with my row, but you kind of see there's a little tail there. And so rho and phi in my particular handwriting don't look particularly differentiable or sometimes I can confuse them. So I like to use another version of lowercase phi, which is um, that. Yeah, this little guy right here. Just make sure you don't confuse it with theta and make sure that those two are different if you choose to do that. But yeah, you'll often see textbooks um, use this version of phi, uh, but it's very, very common for people to handwrite phi like that. I don't know. This is just, if you like that, that's cool. And if you have a good one, just make sure you don't mix it up with your rows. Give your rows a tail or something. Okay, so um, as a review of how to convert between coordinate systems when you're going between spherical and rectangular coordinates, x is defined by rho sine of phi cosine of theta, y is rho sine of phi sine of theta, and rho squared is equal to x squared plus y squared plus z squared, and z is equal to rho cosine of phi. And rather than read the rest of the slide, because we have seen this before when we introduced spherical and rectangular or uh, cylindrical coordinates back in our first unit, these are really just the same formulas that we've seen before. Sometimes people like to solve this one for rho and slap a, a square root on it. Oops, that's t and not a plus, plus z squared. Um, that's, that's fine too. Hey, look at this. This is, a, if you want to go to polar coordinates, that's r squared. And that's how we get this formula down there. 
this is a, a kind of useful, I don't know if you need to go between cylindrical and spherical coordinates ever, then it looks similar to, kind of similar to the polar and rectangular, but r is equal to rho sine of phi and z is equal to rho cosine of phi with those other formulas as well. Okay, so let's do a conversion. Let's convert from rectangular to spherical coordinates. In doing this, I'm going to recklessly apply the formulas that were on the last slide um, without popping back and forth between them. But so let's see. For x, we've got rho sine of phi cosine of theta, all that squared. Now for y, it's going to look similar, but a little change. Rho sine of phi cosine of, whoops, sine, sine of theta. That entire quantity squared plus, now we need to replace z. Well, z is rho cosine of phi minus one squared is equal to one. Now we got to do a little bit of uh, tidying up. So this first expression becomes rho squared sine squared of phi cosine squared of theta plus this expression becomes rho squared sine squared of phi sine squared of theta. Uh, distributing this out, since we have that, that entire quantity squared, we're going to get rho squared cosine squared of phi minus two rho cosine of phi plus one equals one. Well, what's gonna happen on the next line? If I subtract that over, I'm gonna get that equal to zero. So I'll go ahead and do that. I don't know how much of this line we're gonna need, but I'm gonna go ahead and predict that it's gonna be fairly long. All right, so what else, what else, what else, what else? Well, I'm looking at these two the first two terms we have, and I notice that I have the same thing being multiplied by cosine squared and sine squared respectively. So I should be able to factor out that same expression, the rho squared sine squared of phi times cosine squared of theta plus sine squared of theta, and that will quite happily become one by our Pythagorean identity. Uh, plus rho squared cosine squared of phi. Whoops, oh, see, it's easy to go, phi and theta. Uh, minus two rho cosine of phi. Now, what do we have? Well, since this whole expression, this whole orange expression becomes one, now we have another set of rho squared cosine of phi plus rho sine of phi that we'll be able to factor out that rho squared from and get another one, which will tidy up our things nicer as well. All right, so we've got rho squared times sine squared of phi plus cosine squared of phi. Um, that takes care of our red things, minus two rho cosine of phi is equal to zero. And so, this will also become one. And what we have left is rho squared is equal to two rho cosine of phi, moving that two rho cosine of phi from the left side of the equation to the right. Dividing by rho, we get rho is equal to two cosine of phi. And we've done it. We've converted this thing from rectangular to spherical coordinates. So let's do another one. Let's convert z is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared into uh, from spherical to rectangular coordinates. z is going to be rho cosine of phi is equal to the square root. I've got a sizable square root coming here. Rho sine uh, of phi cosine of theta quantity squared plus rho sine phi cosine theta 
quantity squared again, and then we'll end our square root. Now this is uh, very, very similar to what we just did. So I'm gonna borrow the work that we just did and simplifying what you see underneath the root, you're gonna be left with just rho squared sine of phi squared. Once you apply that Pythagorean identity and factor out the rho squared sine, the common rho squared sine of phi. So let's get our left side of our equation along for the ride, rho cosine of phi. All right, we've got two squared things underneath, so that can be sine of phi times rho on the right-hand side, rho cosine of phi. All right, now I notice that if I divide away the phi on both sides or multiply by one over phi, I'm left with cosine of phi is equal to sine of phi. So what conclusions can we draw from this? Well, um, we're working with phi here, right? And so recall that phi varies from pi to zero because phi is the angle off of that uh, vertical z axis. So it goes down to the negative axis and stops at angle pi. So what do you know about cosine of phi and sine of phi when it varies between zero and pi? Remember this is just an angle and so I'm just gonna draw a little sketch here in a sort of two space. I'm not labeling these axes on purpose, um, but what, you're, what we're thinking here is this is just letting phi vary from zero to pi, we're thinking about phi. So where um, are we gonna have cosine of theta equal to sine of theta in this area? Well, I know that at pi over four, both cosine of theta and sine of theta, I'm sorry, it's not theta, cosine of phi and sine of phi take on uh, root two over two positive, uh, so they have equal value there. And then at three pi over four, Cosine takes on a negative version of root two over two, whereas sine takes on a positive version. So the only time they're equal is right there at pi over four. So from this, we can conclude that, whoops, not a, not a marker, but rather, not a highlighter, rather a marker. We can conclude that phi is equal to pi over four. That's gonna be the only time that those two values are equal. You can also think about this as um, on the unit circle, from between zero and pi, where are sine and cosine equal? Only at pi over four, everywhere else they're different. And so what does, we managed to take this entire z is equal to square root of x squared plus y squared and turn it into one thing, just phi is equal to pi over four. And so what does that leave us with? Well, let's try and sketch this thing. Z, um, y, x. Okay, so I'm just going to think, all right, this is, we let phi vary off of the positive x-axis from zero to pi. So in this y, z plane, if you will, just uh, letting phi vary down pi over four would kind of give us about that much movement. Now we can let rho vary because there's no restriction on rho, and so rho can just, is just going to generate a line in that direction. It's just going to keep going forever because there's no restriction on it. And additional to that, we're going to let, um, let's see, we're going to let theta vary all the way around between zero and two pi in the plane. And so that means that we're going to take this, this line segment and kind of swing it around that z axis. And what are we going to generate when we do that? Well, it, symmetrically, it looks something like that. And Oh, I got too many black markers going, so let's let's use blue for what's actually happening. And as we rotate this these points around and letting theta vary, we're going to generate a cone in three space. So we just figured out that when you have a fixed value of phi, you generate a cone when you let rho and theta vary. So that we did a conversion, figured out what the what the region is or what the surface that is related to that region is. And so now we have, um, let's talk about some common surfaces in spherical coordinates. 
So when you let rho equal to four, what that really says is all, I'm just using arbitrary constants here, rho is equal to four means all points are equidistant from origin. You're gonna get a sphere of radius four. And kind of thinking that through, quick sketch here, we got ourselves, okay, that's four. Usual x, y, and z in the usual orientation. So just, I'm gonna pick rho is equal to four along one of these axes here. We'll go with the y-axis and that's four. Okay, so that's great. Now, if I stick this just in the xy plane, I would let theta vary. And so that's gonna let that point swing around and kind of generate this circle in the plane. But we could also let phi vary. Um, so we would have another four away from the origin on the z-axis. And if we let that vary, we would just swing that, that down. And what you're gonna see is you're gonna generate yourself a sphere as you let fixing rho and letting theta and phi vary. For a cone, we just kind of worked through that logic. So I'll go a little bit quickly here for this one. Um, so if we're just to take and swing down an angle of pi over three, uh, that looks kind of like that. It's kind of a wide angle. And so letting, uh, letting rho vary, that's just going to generate a line that runs off in that particular plane. And then letting theta vary, we're going to swing this line, line around the z-axis and sure enough, that's gonna generate a nice cone for us. Now last but not least, if you fix the theta and let rho and phi vary, what are you gonna get? Well, it tells you it's a plane. So let's see if we can convince ourselves of that. Uh, again, x, y, and z in the usual orientation. All right, so now focusing just on the x, y plane, if we were to take and fix theta equals to pi over three, remembering that we start at the positive x-axis and, and go anti-clockwise. Uh, so pi over three is gonna be something like this in the xy plane. Now letting rho, uh, yeah, rho vary, you're just gonna generate a line that keeps going in that direction. And so that line would also go in the, the opposite direction. And then, so that all of your points are gonna be along this line as if you fixed theta and let rho vary. Now, what does phi give us? Well, phi gives us, I'm gonna erase this here in a second, but phi lets us take at this point right here and swing it down from the z-axis or up towards the z-axis all the way down to the negative z-axis. And what that's gonna give us is that's gonna take any of these points on these lines. And as we let them vary along that, we're gonna get a plane as we let them vary for Phi. Sorry, my pictures kind of overlapped each other, but hopefully that's a little helpful. Um, all right, so let's have a look at an animation of kind of integration uh, in spherical coordinates, triple integrals. So the first thing we're gonna do as usual is kind of think about, okay, what about a point? We need to let, a, let something vary so that we get to a point on our surface. So we're gonna let rho vary from zero to whatever bounding surface we have. And when we do that, we get kind of that little line segment. Okay, so now if you take that line segment and let it vary along phi, we'd let it swing kind of either up towards the positive z-axis or down from the z-axis. And what we'll get is a nice little curve, uh, which generates a line and generates a slice of area that contains that initial sort of line segment to a point on the surface, but gives us a nice slice of area there along that phi variance. And last but not least, we're gonna take all of those little thin slices of area and let them vary along for theta, let them swing around symmetrically the z-axis. And we're gonna generate a whole bunch of little slices of area that when we sum them up, are gonna give the volume of our region. And so that's really what we're doing when we're integrating using spherical coordinates. And back to our slides. So what have we kind of done so far? So. Thinking of volume as an infinite sum of infinitely thin slices of volume, which are volume approximated by area when the slices get thin enough. With rectangular coordinates, triple integrals, we slice along area. We take our slices of area that are orthogonal to some coordinate plane. But with both spherical and cylindrical coordinates, sort of our vertical slices are gonna fan out around the z-axis, z letting theta vary from zero to two pi, like we saw in that last animation. And so what about our volume differentials? Well, in rectangular, our volume differential is just 
dx, dy, dz in whatever order you like to set up your integral. Cylindrical coordinates we covered that has that polar area differential in there. So you're going to have the volume differential being r, dz, dr, d theta. And for spherical coordinates, things are a little bit more complicated, but your volume differential becomes rho squared sine of phi d rho d phi d theta. Stuff's hard to read. All right, so here's a method I like to use when generating limits of integration using spherical coordinates. First thing, sketch the domain of integration and projection onto the xy plane. And again, GeoGebra can be your friend to help you plot that. Um, I like to start by doing the row bounds. And since there are row bounds, you're going to integrate first innermost with respect to row. You can have them depending on phi and theta. And in general, with spherical coordinates, we try and solve for rho, and so that sort of makes sense. Um, your middle bounds, then we're going to let phi vary, and since uh, we've taken care of rho, the only variable left is theta, so it's common to have your phi bounds in terms of theta. And last but not least, your most outer integral is going to be your theta bounds, and these will be numbers. These will be the angles that you're going to let theta vary in the plane. And again, while you can do this in, in different order, I find this one to be the most common and kind of the easiest and best for me. All right, so let's work an example here. Let's find the volume of an ice cream cone cut from a sphere of radius one. So rho is equal to one. By the cone, phi is equal to pi over three. So I know I have a nice pretty picture here. I used GeoGebra to do it, but I had to type in the uh, rectangular things because I honestly am not that good at it and don't know how to make spherical coordinates graph on that. So let's, since I am saying this, let's try and sketch this thing out. Okay, so first things first, let's uh, draw ourselves a set of axes in the usual orientation, Z, Y, and X. Okay, so phi is equal to pi over three is going to give us an angle down off of that. Again, I'm kind of thinking about this in the z, y plane there. And so there's our pi over three angle. Now, if you're to let, again, thinking in this z equals, or a z, y plane there, not the z equals y, but z, y plane, if you let rho vary, then that's going to generate a line. Now, I'm going to stop that and say, all right, let's not let that go crazy there. And then letting that swing around, well, that's great. We're going to generate our cone. OK, so kind of all right, letting that vary for theta, swinging that line around the z-axis, we're going to cut out a nice cone through the area. Now, rho is equal to 1 is going to be your x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals rho squared. So rho equals 1 there is going to be a sphere of radius 1 around or centered at the origin. I guess I should maybe label this. There we go. Oh, if I were a better person, I would have made the colors match the graph up there, but that's OK. So now what is the sphere of radius 1 going to do? Well, it's going to hit here up on that at, at 1. It's going to kind of give us a sphere, right? And if I take and let that sphere intersect these, what length are they going to intersect them at? Well, every point on that sphere is, is 1 distance away from the origin, and the, we're letting this line rho extend until it hits a distance. So it's going to hit distance 1. So those lines are, are going to be of length 1. And what we're going to be left with is a nice little cone, which intersects our sphere kind of cap, if you will, kind of making this a nice little sphere cap. And there you go. So that's how you can kind of sketch your way through these things. So let's try and work our way through the bounds now that we have a nice picture, kind of an understanding. Just that thought process of how to sketch this thing kind of helps us think about our bounds, our limits of integration. So where are we going to let phi vary from? Well, let's draw an arbitrary thing here. Well, so if you can imagine kind of a line segment starting at the origin and going right up to the cap there. And conveniently, this kind of matches the animation we looked at earlier. So that cap is defined by. Uh, rho equals 1, so our rho bounds are going to be 0 less than or equal to rho, less than or equal to 1. 
Okay, next we'll think about phi. So our phi bounds. Okay, well phi, that's a, that tells us, well, we're given phi is equal to pi over three. And to imagine that line, we're kind of coming off the Z axis and then keeping going until we crash into that cone. So we're gonna let phi vary between zero, less than or equal to phi, less than or equal to pi over three. Now, last but not least, we've got theta. And for each of these um, kind of slices that we're gonna generate, we wanna let them swing around the z-axis. And so for this particular region, there's no restriction. We want theta to swing all the way around the axis. So we're gonna let it go from zero to two pi. Now I've got two slides for this thing. And so I think I'll go ahead and put this all together on the next slide so I don't run out of room. Um, maybe we can do this real quick. Adam, yeah. All right. All right. So putting that all together, what we've got is our innermost integral went from rho is equal to one to rho is equal to one. Rho is equal to zero to rho is equal to one. And we're integrating, we're trying to find the volume by integrating the region. And so our integrand is just going to be the volume differential, dv. When we're working on the spherical coordinates, that's rho squared sine of phi uh, d rho. And now I'll add in the rest of the uh, differentials as we fill in our thing. Well, the middle one we decided was going to be phi. So this integral is going to let phi, not theta, but phi, vary from 0 to pi over 3. And last but not least, letting theta run wild, we're going to let theta vary from 0 to 2 pi. So let's do this integral. Our innermost integral is going to be the integral from 0 to 1 of rho squared sine of phi d rho. Sine of phi is going to be treated like a constant. So this is going to give us 1 third uh, rho to the third power sine of phi. And if you prefer, you can factor, like factor is the wrong word, but you can pull that sine of phi out in front of the integral and, and worry about it later in the next integral. But I like to kind of bring it along for the ride. And so when we let this thing evaluate from rho is equal to zero to rho is equal to one, well, the zero is going to take care of everything. There's not going to contribute anything there. And we're going to be left with one third sine of phi as the integrand for our middle or phi integral, if you will. So we're going to let phi, whoops, not theta. We're going to let phi vary from zero to pi over three. And we're going to integrate one third sine of phi with respect to phi. That's going to give us what has the derivative of one third sine of phi. Negative one third cosine of phi has derivative one third sine of phi. Evaluate that from phi is equal to zero to phi is equal to pi over three. All right, so what's that going to give us? That's going to give us negative one third cosine of pi over three minus uh, negative one third cosine of zero. Now that's one and negative one third cosine of pi over three is one half. So that's going to give us equals negative one third times one half plus one third. That's gonna give us one negative one sixth plus one third gives us positive one sixth. So our outer integral, our last integral here is gonna be the integral letting theta vary from zero to two pi, integrating the constant one sixth d theta is gonna give us one sixth theta evaluated from theta equals zero to theta equals two pi. So now it's gonna, the zero is not gonna contribute anything. We're gonna get one sixth times two pi. So we're gonna get one third pi as the volume for that ice cream cone. And that brings this lecture to a close.